Well, hey folks, welcome to the Wolf Den. One more time. I want to go fishing Cause it takes my stress away I want to go fishing Try and cast my blues away I want to go fishing I don't want to watch the clock I want to go fishing I don't ever want to stop You know, I'm sitting here looking through some old emails. And I mean, I keep like every email that I probably ever got. I'm like maxing out my Gmail account. And I don't want to make it seem like I forgot, but I sort of forgot. But there is an email that I received. And when was it? Oh, it was back in June. The person who sent me this email was Mikey. Now, he's obviously local because he's got a local area code. It was back when I was thinking about starting, and I did, doing wolf tail videos. Taking a topic that was sort of near and dear to me that I thought was kind of extraordinary. I started it I literally started it with my collection of mirror lures, and nobody gave two hoots about that. I did sort of a, a preview and then a showing of like my lure collection that goes back to like the 50s, late 50s, I think. Nobody cared. That video got no views. So, you know, as I always say, you want to get really... Uh, depressed, just start a YouTube channel. But either way, he said, just some quick ideas for your story playlist, because that's what I was going to call it in the beginning, was just stories. And the first one was your background. Well, I wanted to go through, he actually gave me 19, 19 ideas that would have been Close to 19 uh, separate videos, I guess you could say. I don't want to like go into too deep so I can keep this video relatively short because I'm considering this a vlogging video. He, he asked, what's your background? Well, my background was I was an air conditioning mechanic, kind of cross-trained into being plumbing, doing plumbing. Used to work for air conditioning contractors. I was in the United States Air Force back in the day. Some of them I'd like to forget, but there was times that I liked. And I actually got fired from my job because I fished too much. It was that simple. I used to work for the state at one point. I left working for contractors and went for working for the state, which I always called like a cop that's out on the beat. And then he gets put behind a desk and he's sitting there looking at the outside world. That's what working for the state of Florida was. And I, I did security, police, law enforcement, and the Air Force. And I was trying, and when I got out, I was thinking about going to a police department. Always, even when I went to college, I was going to change my major to law enforcement, and then I quit. I quit college and went in the Air Force because I couldn't stand looking at another book. Other destinations that you have fished, none that are all that. Splendiferous besides, I mean, I went to the Keys, I've been, I fished down in Stewart one day, fished down the Keys a little bit one time, one just on foot trip in Louisiana. I've never really been any place. Stories from your CETO working days. Well, actually, I didn't work for CETO, they would never hire me because uh, they were always so full up with people. So I worked for Towboat U.S. during the recession, depression. Remember that? Started for me about 2009. I should have a t-shirt. Back then I said, I should have a t-shirt that says, I survived the Great Depression. Because as a single business guy, whoo, my God, was that some rough times. You were stuck in the mud or run a ground story. I guess probably the 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 biggest one that just comes to mind was 
uh, running across Mill Cove 30 years ago, running across Mill Cove in my 1974 14-foot Alumacraft with a buddy of mine. And I thought that boat could go anywhere. I thought it was like a Louisiana mud boat. And I'm flying across Mill Cove. And we ran and ran aground. So we actually jumped out. If you don't think mud co uh, Mill Cove, it should be called Mud Cove. Mud Cove was solid silt. You swam in the mud with your legs. Also, that same thing happened to me in the back of Chico Pit Bay, which is totally all changed now. Had to get out and wade through the mud up to our waist. We were like swimming in it with a 14-foot boat in tow. Uh, your favorite TV fisherman you watched growing up? I'd probably say when I was a kid, you know, Bill Dance, Roland Martin, and all those guys that are really old now, they were actually tournament bass fishermen at one time. And I remember very distinctly, and that's why I'm an anti-spinite. If you've ever watched any of my videos, you see I don't use spin and tackle. You know I'm Team Daiwa Ryoga. So I'm a bait caster because I've been throwing bait casters my whole life. And the reason being is when I used to watch those guys on TV on the bass tournament circuit back when BASS was kind of just getting started, I guess you could say. And these guys are fishing these tournaments. They didn't pick up no spinning reels. Everything then was low profile bait casters. So I guess you could say my favorite TV Fisherman when I was growing up was, I guess, anybody who threw a bait caster that was on television. <laughs> uh, let's see, your favorite offshore fishing stories. Oh, God, there's too many to talk about. But one always sticks in my mind. I had an 18, 19 foot center console after I had my 14 foot Alumacraft rowboat that had oars. I did eventually put a trolling motor on it, but it was a fresh, or I had one and it burned up because it was a freshwater pedal drive. But I'll never forget, I dropped a extra 12, 14 gallon tank or something under my console because I found this spot. And no sooner than it gave me 63 gallons with a 142 stroke Suzuki outboard on a, on a 18, 19 foot center console. Well, back then, I mean, I was a Viking. I didn't care. Me and my dad ran something like 58 miles offshore. We started out at BR, Black Mars Reef. Then we went to the Elton Bottom. And after the Elton Bottom, we just kept going. It was slick calm. And I'll never sort of forget that here we're running home. It was a long, long day. My dad's riding, he's driving the boat, coming back on Loran Sea. And he's driving along, and I'm like nodding off in the back of the boat. This is before beanbag chairs and all that crap. And he's like, hey, hey, look at this. I, I kind of came out of my daze, and I go and I look, and my dad drives up to a right whale. There's a right whale on the side of the boat. Literally on the side of the boat. We're floating. There's a right whale just sitting on the surface, sunning himself. And I went, what the hell you doing? And I grabbed the steering wheel and hit the throttle and drove away. And I said, what are you doing pulling up to an animal that with one flipper goes like this? We're in the water. So that scared the bejeebers out of me when you see one of them whales right on the side of your boat. Best or let's say bad weather, rough water encounter story. Oh, I'll have to save that one for later because, my God, you know, best and worst days of fishing. Well, I think I already did that when I did that wolf tail video about my best speckled trout catch where I caught a three, a five, and a ten-pounder in three drifts of a float rig, which that will solidify anybody if you don't think the float rig is a fish-catching machine.
And I've got hundreds and hundreds of videos that also prove it. Okay, boating fails experienced or seen firsthand. Oh, I almost don't even want to admit the worst boating fail I ever had. <laughs> it has nothing to do about sinking or anything like that, but one pops into mind, and I don't think I even want to repeat it. Okay, uh, fishing reports or hot spots. Well, I can tell you right now, I'm in full gear to float rig fish, and then if it's a decent day, I mean, like tomorrow I'm going, and it's going to be, you know, maybe 20 knots, and I just got told the guys. I said, I'm not sure if we're going to want to sit out in the middle of the river on the channel edge doing the red bass thing, you know, the bull reds. You know, on a calmer day, no problem, but good God, on a six-foot tide, we're having a six-foot tide tomorrow. I don't know if I will. They don't understand what kind of work that goes into, all right? But, okay, so that's sort of a fishing report that's going on right now. Float rig, bottom fish, maybe some jigging. Okay, medical emergencies encountered or experienced on the water. Well, I already did that one about a guy who caught a tarpon on my boat years and years ago. Not my aluminum boat, the Maycraft, 23 Maycraft I had before. And he caught a tarpon and died. I already did a wolf tale about that. And all my wolf tales will be in the video description below this video. I don't know if anybody looks at video description since you're on a phone. Okay, uh, Coast Guard boarding or searching stories. Well, the last day of the red snapper season this year, I happened to pull up at a spot. There's no one in sight on the area that I wanted to fish, a set of ledges. I got three people on the boat, a 16-year-old and two women from Austin, Texas, who have never fished a day in their life. And we had like a dozen snapper up to nine pounds, so you know they're thick. If I can take people out, that never fished a day in their life. I never anchored all day. But what I'm, what's sitting out there is a Coast Guard cutter dropping uh, little rib boats over the side. He comes over to me, and it turns out the 16-year-old kid was, like, deathly seasick, and it wasn't even that rough. And uh, they didn't even check me. They didn't do anything because they know me from my aluminum boat because the guy just checked me in the river, like, two weeks before the same guy's. And we sat around talking about aluminum boats, and they actually went back to their ship and brought back some seasick caplets. And the mom of the 16-year-old boy broke them open, poured them in a little water, shook it up in a water bottle, and told him to chug that. He chugged it. About an hour and a half later, he was perfectly fine. So, uh, let's see, medical emergencies encountered, Coast Guard boarding, St. John's River now versus Old River before crazy current and dredging. Oh! Yeah, you don't have to ask me. Number one, I'm against all the dredging. I'm against all the shipping. I'm not really into these Navy security zones that, you know, we get treated like Osama bin Laden's cousin or something. You know, you get Bob and Alice and little five-year-old Jimmy on the boat, and you go over to fish where you've been making your living for, for 20 years, and the, the Navy comes over and yells at you. But all that is the demise of our fishery, just so you know. The dredging and the crazy currents and all that. Rescues. Oh, I got one. Oh, yeah, one time I'm out with a husband and wife, and we're float rig fishing the inside of the North Jetty. And it is pretty kind of rolly, but not terrible. But we're along the rocks. And we're hearing this, <coughs> off in the distance. And the guy's wife turns to me and goes, is that somebody out there waving for us? And I'm like, what? I mean, you know, I mean, we're talking like half mile away looking. Well, it was some guys that got hit by the pilot boat and a ship and a little rolled edge 16 footer and it submerged straight down to the rolled edge gunnels. And they're standing, when we pulled the anchor and ran out to them, 
They're standing in the middle of the boat, not even wanting to move. Because if they just moved, that thing was flipping over. And I pulled up to them, and I just went right next to them, and I said, jump, jump! And they all jumped in my boat. And I grabbed their anchor line or whatever, and I took off, and it washed all the water out of the back of the boat. So I took them back to the dock, and it's a long story after that, but... They went fishing again. They sunk the boat, practically sunk the boat, and then we're down at the Dames Point Bridge, and they're, ah, hey, Captain Dave, thanks, thanks. They're all waving. I'm like, damn. Thoughts on FWC regulation. I'll put this in a nutshell. Scientists can do all the science they want, but the people who know are us, us fishermen. We know, and the FWC is basing everything all the time. You hear, oh, the scientific data. You know, that, uh, to me, scientific data, you know where they get most, a lot of their data? Is from boat ramp surveys. Total bullshit. Night fishing stories. Well, I got one, because I'm not a night fisherman. I'm a guy who gets up at, Typically, like this morning, I was up a quarter to four. I'm a morning person. At eight o'clock, like my hours are 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. Give me time to get out on the water, get my coffee, get my thing done, get going, and then we can talk. But at eight o'clock, I'm of the persuasion don't let the door hit you in the ass because I'm tired and I'm probably in my lazy boy zonking out by eight o'clock at night. So, I have one fishing story. We left at 7 o'clock at night to go trout fishing. We did not catch anything worth a hoot until like 12.30, quarter to 1. We limited out on trout on one spot. Got back at uh, 3 in the morning. It was kind of, everything was dewy when I put the trailer and the truck back down. And I came off my boat, off my ladder... And my foot slipped, and I grabbed my la ladder like that to keep myself from falling in the water. And I, like, dislocated or something my shoulder. And to this day, I've got a big old lump right there where I guess it when it popped in or something, it didn't heal right or whatever. I don't go night fishing, especially right now. I counted, what, the other day I counted, like, 11 or 12 barges and bullshit in the river. Who knows what they got out there? I just sat on a spot with a customer two weeks ago. We anchored in eight feet of water. We go to leave, and there's a dredge cable, big steel cable, on my anchor in the first spot, and I can't even get it off. And him and me, him and I, grunted to death while his girlfriend watched us trying to get a dredge cable off my anchor in eight feet of water on the first spot in the first 30 minutes of the charter. So there you go. That's my, uh, that's, that's that. Boat show stories. There ain't nothing like the Miami International Boat Show. Leaving here at 5 a.m., it's usually over Valentine's Day weekend. You leave here at 5 a.m. and you go down to Miami. You'll be there by 12.30, 1.30, You'll be at the boat show by 2.30, and it is the greatest thing in the world. And the women, ha, the Chiquita bananas are everywhere. Up here, the, the girls are wearing uh, flannel shirts. Down there, they're wearing nothing. That's my boat show story. If you ever never been to the Miami International Boat Show, in the middle of February, Go down to La La Land, Cosmo, Florida, the concrete cities, and enjoy it, and then get the hell out. All right, future predictions on what fishing will be like in Jacksonville. If it's going the way that they say, or way that they think, even the Coasties are saying, they're going to be dredging into 2023, the Coasties told me. My predictions aren't good. I mean, for the next generation, I, I don't really truly believe. Fish filleting or cooking stories? Well, you know, my fish filleting story is all about filets all. 
the Flazol blades, serrated Dexter Russell stainless steel carbon steel blades that are scalloped, have a milled end that fits in any reciprocating saw. Take a lithium ion battery Makita portable one handed reciprocating saw and stick that in there, and you can clean. Any fish, I don't clean small and or soft fish like trout, even though I can because I got a little thin blade called the freshwater blade. But that will revolutionize how you clean sheep's head, drum, red fish. But around here, we've got such strict limits. I know the guys over in Louisiana, I mean, you go out, you get 10 reds, 15 reds on a charter. 100 trout, 38 drum, and two flounder. That revolutionizes fish cleaning for them. Okay, and he finishes up by saying, love your channel and keep it up. Mike. I'm not going to say his last name, but I hope he knows who he is. His email was Mikey13. Mikey13, if you're out there, thanks. But I just wanted to go through it, make a little vlog here in the the beginning of the week and let you know about some of the stuff that obviously he was wanting to know about. So thanks for watching. The season is starting to get in full tilt now and it's going to get nothing but better and better and better as we go along. I'll see you on the next one and thanks for watching. Oh, and don't forget, hit that bell because that like Give it a thumbs up and hit the bell so you get the notifications. I'm supposed to say that. I'm supposed to be beating that into everybody's head. Subscribe, give it a thumbs up, and don't forget, hit that notification bell.